Hey internet, it's me. Now, a while back, I said I was going to make a Polymega video that went through every aspect of the console. Uh, unboxing it, and setting it up, installing the games, playing the games, everything you can think of. And this is going to be that video. However, uh, when I initially got it, I received my Polymega on March 21st. It is now April 7th, so it's been just over two weeks, two weeks and three days, I think, something like that. Um, I That first day, the 21st, I recorded four hours of footage. I unboxed the console and every module, uh, I went through all the controllers, I installed the hard drive, I uh, got footage of installing a bunch of the games and how long that takes. I was pretty meticulous. I got a lot of video. And I was just waiting to finish installing the rest of my collection to make the video so that I could also cover what games did and did not work. However, um, my ongoing battle with OBS and technology in general uh, wages on. And it turns out that all of the screen capture footage from that original video didn't record properly, or got corrupted, or the gods have cursed me. I don't really know what the issue was. All I know is I do not have that footage. And because I don't have the screen recording, half of the footage I took of myself referring to the screen recordings isn't going to make sense. So, I'm making this video... And I'll maybe put in parts of that video, and we'll just see what happens. But at the end of the day, I do still want to cover everything about the console. So, we're just going to do that. I'm going to do my best. We'll see what happens. Who knows? Um, first, I'll start with some of the positives. Uh, these are the boxes the console comes in. Uh, this is for one of the modules. The console box is very similar. I have to say, right off the bat, the box itself, I absolutely love, for one very simple reason. It's, now it's not going to, gravity's not going to work for me, but uh, it's like a board game style box where the top lifts off. There's no flaps you have to deal with, you don't have to cut any tape or break a seal or anything like that. It's just a good, sturdy, easy to open and close box. And I appreciate that. It's a very little thing, but it's noticeable, and I like it. Uh, so right off the bat, my initial first impression of the console, just opening the box, actually made me really happy. On to the console and the modules themselves. This is the console itself. It's really sturdy. Uh, it doesn't feel cheap at all. Like, it's got some good heft to it. It feels like a real decent console. Uh, there's the disk drive in the front where you put the various games, PlayStation, Turbo Graphics CD, uh, Sega Saturn, Sega CD. They all go in there. It reads them. Uh, you install them on the console. Then you can play them without putting the disc in again, which is great. It has USB ports, uh, so you can plug in the Universal Controller. Uh, it also has a wireless adapter if you want to use it wirelessly. Um, you can also plug in a variety of... Uh, other controllers, like I think all the 8-bit dough controllers work in here. Uh, I think if you have the cords, not 100%, don't quote me, I haven't tested every controller I own, or even a majority of them, um, but I think the, P the PlayStation either 4 or 5 controllers work, as well as some of the Xbox controllers, uh, but honestly, you're not going to need those. I'm going to talk about controllers for a second now, I'll set that down. These are really good. This is the Universal Controller. Uh, it's got, you know, built-in rumble, the dual joysticks, the same button layout you expect from any modern controller. And it fits comfortably in the hand. It's not a bad controller. It also doesn't feel like cheap plastic, like it's good construction. And when you, like, you know, wrench on it and twist it, it doesn't creak and groan like cheap controllers do because you can tell you're stressing it. So it doesn't feel like it's going to break. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's poorly made. It's a really good controller, and honestly, that's one thing that I can say about all of the Polymega controllers, is they all feel solid. This is the one for the 64. Uh, I'm glad they created their own controller, because honestly, the 64 ones are not my favorite. 
this condenses everything into just two sides. Uh, so whether the game originally had you holding the middle joystick in the right or the left joystick in the right, or I don't think there are many that did it, but if you did like the left side in the middle, this doesn't have to deal with any of that now. It has just all the buttons on a regular controller layout because humans only have two hands, and why did Nintendo make that controller? Uh, so that's really good. Also, they've got them for the Turbo Graphics, Sega Genesis, the NES. They all feel really good too. And I'm going to talk about the NES one for a second because they made some changes from the original NES controller that I thoroughly enjoy here. For one, if you remember the original controller, it's very angular. It is a rectangle complete with 90 degree corners. This has rounded corners. So if you're holding this in your hand like this, it's not digging into your palm here where the old controller would be. Likewise, you can see when holding it normally, I know it's upside down for you, but this is how you would, here, like that, uh, where your thumb fits naturally covers both buttons. On the original, the buttons were side by side, so you kind of had to do a little bit of a weird move to hold both of them, or just like push the corners of the buttons. But this, they both fit naturally under your thumb. You can easily hit one or both at the same time. It's just, it's a better layout. And it also has the little grooves on the back uh, where it kind of juts out behind where your hand's going to be. So you have a good spot for these fingers to rest and hold on to. And it just makes holding and gripping the controller a lot easier. It's more comfortable in your hand. It's, it's definitely a better controller than the original. And the most important thing I should mention about all the controllers that come with the Polymega is that it has an original controller port on it. So if you wanted to, you could plug this into your NES and play the NES with this controller. You don't have to use an NES controller anymore. This can replace that, not just on the Polymega, but on any console. Your AVS, uh, the original NES, uh, one of the Retron monstrosities, like this will work in any of those, and that's really cool. The one controller I didn't show you yet, mostly because I forgot to pick it up when I was grabbing the rest of them, is this one. This is the Super Nintendo controller that they created. I have to say, this is the one controller of theirs I am not a fan of. Um, it's not bad. It's the same solid construction. It doesn't creak or moan. It's got, you know, a good button layout, all of that. The issue for me is... I don't know. I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, this has the backing thing, too, that should make it more comfortable in your hand, but it just... It doesn't. The way it's built, it doesn't feel comfortable in your hand. It feels weird. Uh, these domes are like, they're too wide for your fingers to grab the edge. You know, you're not going to hold the controller like this. Like, that's obnoxious. Your fingers would naturally rest about here. And just, I don't know, it feels weird in the hand. It's not bad. It's still a completely functional controller. It's perfectly fine. I don't hate it or anything. I'm not mad. It's just not as comfortable and convenient as the other ones. Uh, the other ones I'd give like a 9 out of 10 for just usability and comfort and layout. This one I'd probably give more like a 6 or 7. Like it's not bad. It's a perfectly fine controller. I have no real complaints about it. Just something about how it fits in your hands feels off. It's a little weird. You'll probably notice it too when you get one. Um, it's just, I don't know that's all I can describe it. It's just weird. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel bad. It just doesn't feel right. Uh, but that's the controllers. Uh, as you may have noticed, like I said, all the controllers have the original ports. That's because when you have a module on here, for example, I currently have the NES module, you'll notice that it adds controller ports for that original console. Uh, the Sega Genesis module, the Super Nintendo module, the Turbo Graphics, the 64 module, they all do the same thing. They add the controller ports so you can plug in original controllers or these controllers that they include with them or any aftermarket ones that you have. But we use all of them. Uh, so that's really cool. You can use these, your NES controllers. I like the diversity there. I like that they included those ports. That's pretty cool. You can also use your universal controller if you want to. To play the games from any of these systems, you don't have to use system-specific ones. Um, 
the one caveat I will add there, though, is that if you're going to do that, don't do it for the 64. Uh, the simple reason being, the 64 has more buttons than a regular controller does. Uh, there's your A and B, your four C buttons, L and R, and then your trigger. Uh, which, if you add those all up, that's nine buttons. If you look at a regular controller, it's got your four here, your shoulders, your triggers. That's eight buttons. So, there has to be some weird mapping if you try to use that for a 64 game. One of your buttons is not going to be accessible. So, like I said, I don't recommend doing that. Um, if you're going to do the 64, get the controller that comes with it, or use a 64 controller. Other than that, I actually just use the Universal Controller for everything. It's comfortable, feels good, it's great. Speaking of, when you're playing the games and using a controller, uh, there is a disadvantage to using one of the um, one of the original controllers or like a third-party one that didn't come with the Polymega, and that's not having this button. This button, unlike the PlayStation or the Xbox controllers, does not turn on the console, which is very annoying, by the way. Uh, but that's not what this is. This is the menu button in the Polymega. So when you're playing a game and you hit this button, pauses the game, and it brings up a menu, and that's where you can do your save states, uh, you can take a screenshot, you can change console or game-specific settings. It's all accessible through that menu. Uh, that's also how you exit the game and get back to the Polymega interface so that you can choose a new game. If you're using just an NES controller or a Nintendo 64 controller or whatever, you obviously don't have that button, so the only way to access that menu is to reset the console. Uh, so I do recommend using the Polymega controllers just all the time. Um, they're good controllers, they fit in your hand, everything's great, and you have that extra functionality that's pretty annoying to not have. Um, but let me move on to the functionality of the console itself. Um, actually, no, let me back up and talk about the hardware a little more, a little bit. Uh, there's extra things I should note. Like I said, it's got the USB ports, CD drive, and then your modules go on there, which, by the way, are super easy to remove. There's an eject button here on the side. You push that, and as you can see, the module disconnects itself, and then it slides off. There's these guide rails here to make sure it's always going to stay in place so you can't connect it improperly. You just put it on, follow the guide rails, slide it up, it connects, and it stays on there. Like, it's it's a solid connection. It's not going to fall. Um, but in addition to all of that, there is uh, built-in Wi-Fi and also a network port, so you can plug it in. Um, next to that is an SD card slot where you can put a micro SD card. I'll talk about that in a bit. Hey, so it's Editor Dean here. I realized I forgot to actually come back to the whole micro SD card thing, so I'm going to do that real quick. Basically, the micro SD card is there to allow you to install uh, patch files and also alternate BIOS files. Uh, because while the Polymega does have its own BIOS files, as I mentioned later, they created their own so that the emulators that they distribute are legal. Um, Theirs are only so good. Uh, th there are some issues that they'll run into with the occasional game. Not many. I, I don't want to like overstate issues. Uh, I've run into none, but I guess there are some. Uh, and some of those issues can be mitigated simply by telling the console to use the original system BIOS files from you know the Saturn, the Sega CD, the PlayStation, what have you, as opposed to the ones that come on the Polymega. And to do that, you have to download those original files with the exact correct uh, file name. Uh, and this is all on FAQ on Polymega's site. Uh, but you have to download those files, put them on a micro SD card in a folder called BIOS, and then the system can read them. Likewise, if you have any uh, like ROM hack patches, um, randomizer patches for Pokemon, or even just uh, fan translation patches... Uh, you would put those in a folder called patch at the root of the micro SD card. And then when you're starting a game, you would have the option to start it with a patch uh, selected. And what that will do is the Polymega will automatically apply that patch to the game ROM as ripped from your media and then play the game accordingly. Uh, so 
it's kind of nice. It patches your ROMs for you, assuming you actually have the patch. Um, and it's just a cool extra little feature, and I just wanted to make sure I pointed those things out. Um, so yeah, that's that. Now back to previous point in time me, I guess. And then at the bottom here, this little cover with the screw on it, that's where your SSD goes if you want to expand the memory of this thing. Um, <clears throat> built in, it has, I think, like 100 gigs. Uh, and then, you know, you can install your games. It'll fill up. So if you want, you can expand it by putting in an SSD. If you just have cartridges, the onboard memory is more than enough. Uh, games on cards take up no space at all. They're, they're minuscule. You know, your Turbo Graphics, your NES, your Genesis and Super Nintendo games, I think they're all measured in kilobytes. If they are in megabytes, it's a small amount. Like, they are not big files. You could fit your whole collection on the 100 gigs that this has. When you get to discs, however, those are bigger files. Uh, those are anywhere from, I think, like four to 800 megs each. Um... And, you know, there are games with multiple discs, and some of those, like the PlayStation, has a massive game library. You could easily get up into the tens or even hundreds of gigabytes install installing all your disc games. So, you're probably going to want to install an extra drive. Yeah. A lot of people on the Discord, and I was very active on the Polymega Discord. More on that in a bit, too. Um... Everyone recommended that you get the, I forget the name of the set, but there's a set out there that has all the screwdrivers that can be used to open video game cartridges and consoles. It has all the specialty bits, uh, like, I think they actually just call it a game bit. Um, there's also the Tri-Wing that Nintendo used, um, and also they all come magnetic, so they'll grab the screws and hold them as you unscrew them, and they won't just fall. I did not listen. I figured, I have small screwdrivers. I work on electronics. It's fine. Um, I'll just use one of those screwdrivers and do the thing. How hard can it be to put in a hard drive? Yeah, turns out those other people probably had those drivers too and knew what they were talking about, and I'm a jackass. Um, installing an SSD without the proper driver is a gigantic pain. The screw doesn't want to get into the right position, and also there are multiple holes in there where if you drop the screw, it falls into your console and you'll probably never see it again, but you will hear a lovely noise when you shake it, and your very expensive console will become a maraca. I luckily did not do that, but I spent so much time uh, trying to put the screw on and hold the drive in place properly and not drop or lose anything. Uh, in fact, that's footage that I can use because you don't need the screen recording for context. So I'm going to drop that here. Not going to lie, that loosened a lot easier than I was led to believe. That did not seem as factory tightened as everyone said. So some people might have been uh, over-exaggerating the problem there. Anywho, once you remove that, you will now see an empty slot. And I realize now that that's the screw they were talking about. And that's why you want a magnetic driver, because there's a lot of empty space in there for that screw to fall into, like right into the case of your console, if you get it wrong. Let's see how tight that screw is. Oh yeah, that bad boy's not moving. Okay, I broke the tension. I'm going to unscrew it upside down. That way, if it falls, which it did, falls in my lap, not into the console. I'm a thinker. So, once you've taken that screw out, you need one of these. And, uh, what is it? M.2 NVMe PCIe SSD. A lot of initialisms, basically, is what you want. Uh, now, this one's 4 terabyte. From what I understand, this can support up to, it's either 4 or 8, I don't remember which, uh, but I know 4 is supported, I checked on their website ahead of time. Also, 4 terabytes is absolute overkill. You can install the entire libraries of every console that this supports, 
and probably not cross that threshold. So if you're going to get a supplemental hard drive, four terabytes is more than enough. Two, honestly, is probably more than enough. I just like to go overboard because, I don't know, I'm a bit extra if the room didn't give it away. So uh, I've also never used one of these hard drives before. This is unimaginably small. Uh, this is a tangent here. It doesn't matter for anything, but uh, if you're as old as I am, you remember when home computers started. This is insane that this is four terabytes, right? Like, that's obscene. I had, like, the big three-and-a-half-inch drives that were measured in megabytes, and this just doesn't matter. I'm old. So, we're going to put this in here. Uh, pretty straightforward. Probably don't need to show you this bit. You plug the thing in the only way that it fits into the slot. You then push it into said slot, which is proving to be a bit of a challenge. There it goes. Oh, and you do it at an angle. Ha. Okay. Now that that's in there, this screw driver is not magnetic because I did not listen. So let's see if I can do this with that. You know what? We're going to go upside down again. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Balls. This is why everyone said, get a magnetic screwdriver beforehand. Everyone said it. The whole subreddit talked about tons of warnings. It was like your PBS, you know, brought to you by the letter C, public service, the more you know announcement. And I didn't listen. Should have listened. Didn't listen. Uh, okay, well, that's not ideal. Now it's over there. <sighs> this video is going to be significantly longer watching me struggle through simple crap because I don't heed warnings. On the plus side, I want this video to be a real representation of what it's like to get this console so that all of you know what to expect. And if nothing else, this is very real. Clearly, this is not staged or scripted or planned because no one would plan to be this stupid on video. Balls. Double balls. Well, now where the hell is it? Are we having fun yet? By the way, for any of you that follow my film career, that was a reference. And to everyone that doesn't follow my film career, what's it feel like to be everybody? Okay, I think. No, no, no. Premature celebration. Not to be confused with premature anything else, internet. Oh, bloody hell. Oh. Okay, I'm beginning to hate myself and this console. Not gonna lie. This screw could not be smaller or more awkwardly placed. I just, I just want to put that out there. That this, like, this feels like a personal attack. Like, if the Joker were real, this is what he would do. He would just take a really small screw and put it, like, in the Batmobile somewhere. Be like, hey, you can thwart me if you can manage to get this screw where it belongs with no tools or appropriate planning. Holy crap, I did it. Take that, Joker. Okay, so 14 hours later. So yeah, like I said, get the proper drivers. That was infuriating. Um, but, as you saw, I did eventually put the hard drive in. I now have four terabytes, which is more than enough space. Uh, I do want to mention, though, that after you install the drive, you know, you start the thing up, it'll recognize the drive and do what it has to do. Um, and the game also, or the console, rather, will install some updates when you use it for the first time. Um, the OS on this takes up an unreasonable amount of space. Uh, between its own drive on board and a good partition of space on the SSD that I installed. This is taking up, I want to say it's a little over 200 gigabytes. That is unreasonable. That is obscene. 
Windows 11 does not take up that much space. Um, the Microsoft Office Suite, Photoshop, uh, SQL, which is a server management utility, all of those things combined do not take over 200 gigabytes. This is insane. Uh, that is definitely a complaint I have. I don't know what the hell's going on with the OS of this thing. It does not need to take up that much space. And yes, I know, they have databases for all of the various um, games that are on here. So for each console, they have a, gata a database of all the games for that console and the various iterations, you know, the European, Japanese, and North American release. Uh, so when you put your game in, it can it will check the database, match it to the data, say, oh, you would put in this game, and it will load the box art and the various metadata and everything. That's great. In those databases, they're not storing the ROM files, or at least they really shouldn't be, because that would be the stupidest way to do it. Um, you, they're just storing what's called a hash, which is basically you take all of the code from the game, you have a computer system, and I'm trying to dumb this all down. There are people out there that will get mad at this explanation. I'm oversimplifying on purpose, so calm down. Um, basically, it takes all the code from the game, all of the metadata, everything, and it generates a unique string that represents that code. Uh, so then, what is stored, theoretically, in here, in this database, is that hash. So when you put your game cartridge in, you know, you put in Sonic Spinball. Um, this will use that same algorithm to look at the code for your Sonic Spinball cartridge, convert it to that unique string, that little identifier, and then compare that string to all the strings in the database. If there's a match, it says, oh, this game matches this other game. So, let me give you the data from the game in my database. So they don't have to store the whole game file. They just store that hash string as well as the metadata that they want to load. So this database, even if it includes every game for every console, uh, I'll get to that in a bit too, it should not be that big. And the OS is just a series of emulators. And I know some emulators are complicated. They're not so complicated that they should take up more space than the current top-of-the-line operating system. And I hate that I just called anything Microsoft has made top of the line, but you know what I mean. So that's annoying. Um, you know, I have four terabytes, it's fine. Like, I have ample space. It's just, it's obnoxious. As someone that works in IT, I don't like bloatware. I don't like when file sizes are bigger than they need to be. And unless someone from Polymega or Playmaji is the name of the actual company, unless they want to explain to me what the hell is taking up two gigabytes... It feels like bloatware, and I don't like it. But I will move on. Uh, now, I've mentioned a few things that I said I would get to later. Uh, let me start with the Discord and the subreddit. Um, and Playmaji in general. Playmaji is... What is the way to say this? Absolute bullshit. They are a terrible, terrible company. Um, do a little history lesson here. When they first announced the Polymega... It was going to be a console that was completely FPGA. Uh, again, I'm going to oversimplify everything because not everyone who watches these videos works in IT. Uh, to be clear, no one watches these videos. But if you're one of the two people that somehow does, you might not work in IT. And you don't need overly technical crap. So, what FPGA means is when you put in a game... Hold on. Ta-da! This is a video game. When you put this game into the Polymega, I know that's the wrong module, so it's just set there. Um, what the Polymega will do, it's not going to bring up an emulator, which is just a piece of software pretending to be an NES, or in this case, a Sega Genesis. Um, what an FPGA console does is it has... This is hard to explain in layman's terms. It has hardware that basically can reconfigure itself to match the hardware that originally played this game. Uh, so even though I'm not putting it into a Sega Genesis, the console will physically mimic a Sega Genesis and just natively play whatever's on here. 
you know, a lot of emulator boxes like uh, the Retron, or if you use most of the stuff in RetroArch with Retro Achievements, um, or any of those kinds of things, those emulators, uh, they have a database similar to what this has of all the games that were released for the console and are, we'll just say, approved to run with that emulator. Uh, so if you put in some indie homebrew games like any of the stuff released by Broke Studio or Pico Interactive uh, or any of the reproductions made by Limited Run Games, uh, any of that stuff, it's not going to recognize those as valid games and they're not going to play. What an FPGA console does is it acts like a Sega Genesis. And so whatever cart you put in, it does not care. It's going to play it because it's just a Sega Genesis. It's completely agnostic. It's not looking at a database. It's, it doesn't care what the ROM on the cartridge is. It just says, this is a Sega Genesis game. I know how to be a Sega Genesis. I'm going to play this game. Uh, so that's what the Polymega originally was going to be. It was going to have the CD drive, and you would put in your PlayStation or your Saturn or your Sega CD, your 3DO, CDI, whatever disc, and the FPGA hardware in there would do, I'll call it emulation, but that's not technically correct. Um, it would pretend to be whatever that console is. It would change itself to act exactly like that console and just read and play the disc as is, regardless of what's on it. Um, so that was their initial pitch. That was years ago. Uh, when they originally announced this, I want to say it was in the early 2010s. I don't have my phone with me to look up the exact date, and I am bad at making videos because I did not do the research ahead of time, but that was quite a while ago. I heard about the Polymega then, and I actually backed it because originally they crowdfunded. Um, and then they changed direction. They said, actually, we're going to emulate instead. Um, and so what that means is now there are emulators. And like I said, there's the database. You put your disc in, it checks against the database. If it recognizes it, then it plays it. If not, um, it might try to play it as unrecognized game media, but more on that in a bit. Um, so originally, when I heard they were changing directions, I decided, okay, maybe I don't want this. There's a million emulator boxes already out there. You know, I had a Retron at that point, and that's a very hit or miss console because it's an emulator and doesn't play on supported games. I didn't want to go down that route again. So I just, I, I, I decided not to back it. I kind of lost interest. I basically forgot about the console. Um, years later, I heard people mentioning it again. Uh, it seemed like it was still in production. It wasn't going to happen. You know, it was a stuck in development hell, maybe even a scam. Who knows? Um, so I kind of lost interest again. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that thing. It sucks that it never happened, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. And then sometime last year, I don't remember how, but I stumbled across it again. Uh, people were talking about it and saying, hey, it's going to ship soon, and Atari just uh, partially bought, you know, Playmaji, the company that released it, and, like, it was a whole big thing. I'm like, oh, I remember that. So I looked into it some more, and one of the things that they do now is they have all the modules, so it's not just the CD games anymore. They will play all of your cartridge-based games using these modules, which is really cool. Um, but also, they, if you put in a game that isn't in their database, the emulator will still try to run it. And you can add in, as like a custom thing, all the metadata and define what the game is. So if the hardware is able to play it, uh, even as an unrecognized game, you can still install it and add it to your collection. And that's the big thing I didn't touch on yet, is when you put in your game discs or your game cartridges, it installs them. It builds a collection on here, on the hard drive that you installed, and it holds them there. And it recognizes these are all the games that you have. Uh, this is your entire collection. It's like a virtual bookshelf, basically. So once you do that, if you want to play that game, you don't need to reinsert the disc or the cartridge. You can just play the game, regardless of what controller you're using or what module is connected. Once you've installed it, it's yours, it's there, you can just play it. Um, so if you have a very large collection, like yours truly, and you have 
I don't know, let me pick a random number, 1,318 games across all the platforms that the Polymega supports, you can put them in and install them, and then you never have to change media again. I don't have to change consoles. I don't have to take out discs and put in carts or vice versa. It's all just here, and I can play it. That's the theory. Um, so I heard all that, and I'm like, oh, that actually, that does sound appealing. I'm still not sure how I feel about emulator boxes. I'd really rather it be FPGA, but there are benefits to doing it the way they do. For example, if you have these databases and you recognize games and you know that this game matches the one in your database, you can do stuff, for example, like add achievements because you know what the games are. If someone puts something in, you know, oh, it's this game, the code looks like this. And in this game, we know there are certain milestones players try to hit. Let's build achievements based on those milestones. Also, they could do a cheat menu where if they know what the game is, you've matched and said, yep, this is a copy of Mega Man 3. Well, then you can put in the Game Genie codes and just store them in the database on your console so that when someone puts in their Mega Man 3 cart and it matches and says, yep, definitely Mega Man 3, then they just have the option to toggle on and off those cheats for, you know, the moon jump or infinite energy or an always full charge on each of your sub-weapons. Um, they can do those kinds of things. And that's great. That would be really cool. They did not do those things. Any of those things. A lot of room for improvement there. But, back to what I was originally kind of talking about. Uh, Playmagia is bullshit. And now I'll touch on why. See, I heard about this console in the middle of last year after Atari acquired some of their stock. The reason Atari had to acquire some of their stock is because Playmagia took orders for the Polymega. People gave them a bunch of money and said, yes, I want one of your consoles. This is a pre-order. I'm giving you money. You give me a console. That's how commerce works. Uh, what Playmagia did is said, cool, we'll totally take your money. And then they placed orders with a manufacturer, and then they didn't pay the manufacturer. So the, manuf the manufacturer produced the consoles and then held on to them because they didn't get any money. You know, they, if you don't pay them, they're not going to release the hardware to you. They don't build things for free. Um, and Playmagia said, oh, well, I don't know. We don't have the money to give you. I don't know if they spent it on payroll. I don't know if they spent it on cocaine. I don't know where the money went. I just know, as me, the awkward gamer, this guy sitting here in front of the camera, I personally know that the money did not go to the manufacturer. So, that means all the people that had placed pre-orders were never getting a console. The money was gone. The consoles were not being released. It was never going to happen. They had been ripped off. It was a scam. They did not receive anything. Now, I'm not saying it was intended to be a scam. I'm not saying they planned to rip people off. But the truth of the matter, the actual facts, what historically happened that we can prove is that Playmagi did not give the money to the manufacturer and none of the customers were going to get games. They, they can't deny that. That is what happened. That is the actual facts of the case. You know, um, had Atari not come along and things just continued down that road, when you heard Playmagi or the Polymega, it would probably be in the subject line of a lawsuit and being covered on the Legal Eagle channel. But Atari did come along. Atari said, hey, we're going to give you a bunch of money, go pay your manufacturer, and let's get these consoles out the door. Also, we're going to do an Atari module. It will play 2600 and 7200 games because they're the same form factor. They use the same chipset and the same amount of pins. Um, so that's what they did. Uh, and around that time is when I placed the order. Because I said, okay, you know, Atari's on board now. They've been around for a while. They know what they're doing. Uh, this should be a semi-safe bet. I'll do the thing. And Playmagia, around the time this happened, they also released a public statement said, hey, we realize there's been some issues. There's been a lot of delays. Uh, we haven't delivered what we said we would yet. We apologize for that. We're working on a Polymega app for your phone. And, um, you know, because people don't have their console yet, we want to apologize to you. We want to make it up to you. We want to retain you as customers. So what we're going to do is 
all of our customers that have already pre-ordered are going to get a free year of our premium app. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I, you know, I'm like, you know what? I like the idea of this. I like having more consoles and more ways to play my old hardware. And I love the idea of not having to change hardware all the time. So let me get one of these. I went all in. I got the base module, uh, the base unit, and every module. So like I said, the 64, Turbo Graphics, NES, Super NES, and Sega Genesis. Um, I got a couple extra controllers, a second Universal controller, and then a second uh, 64 controller. And I also ordered their light gun controller, which I will get to in a bit. Um, so, all in. Said and done, that was about $1,000. It's a very expensive console. I will put that out there now. Uh, if you're not someone with a lot of expendable income, disposable income is the word, uh, this is probably not going to be in the realm of reality for you. This is very expensive. However, I placed my order. They made their apology. Atari bought some stock. Things were on the up and up. Uh, at one point, they sent out, I don't remember if it was a tweet or how they um, communicated it, but they said, hey, surprise coming. Everyone is going to have consoles in hand. All our pre-orders are going to be filled by the end of the year. Uh, that year was last year, 2023. So people on the Discord went crazy. Everyone was talking about, oh my god, these are the games I'm going to play. This is what I'm going to do. I'm so excited. We're finally getting these. Uh, the subreddit started to get posts a little more frequently. Not as much, but every now and then, um, people were excited. And then it got closer and closer to Christmas uh, and the end of the year. And an email came out telling everyone, hey, verify your mailing address. We're getting ready. And everyone's like, oh my god, it's really happening. We're going to get our consoles. This is great. That's when I made my last video saying, hey, I'm going to make a Polymega review. If you have questions, let me know. By the way, none of you did. You're all jerk faces. All two of you. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, everyone was excited. And the end of the year came and went. No one had a console. Then, uh, shortly after that, uh, Playmanji, or a representative thereof, went to uh, the online interwebs, and they posted something saying, Hey, good news! We have a release window for our consoles. We are going to ship them out for all pre-orders up to November 2023 uh, by the third week of February. Now... I don't know if you've been following this story. I know I talk a lot, so maybe you lost interest. Let me recap. They said that all consoles would be in hand. All pre-orders would be filled by the end of the year. They're now saying everyone up to November in 2023 will have them by the third week of February. And this is good news. So what they're saying is the good news is that this deadline is gone. They've missed that. They forgot about that. We're going to pretend that never happened. But now we have a new deadline two months later. And that's good news. Also, you'll notice a theme here. Um, uh, them not acknowledging the thing. Uh, but anyway, good news. So, people were a little annoyed, a little upset, because they missed a deadline. And they didn't acknowledge that they missed the deadline. They didn't apologize for the deadline. Um, they didn't admit that they did anything wrong. They just said, hey, February. That's when people are getting their stuff. Uh, so, people were annoyed, but... Whatever, we're just going to ride this ship out. We already spent our money. You know, we're close to the finish line now. Let's just do what we got to do. So there there was some infighting. There were some attitudes. People were upset. There was a few people that were just simping for the company and going to defend it no matter what because, I don't know, they're probably porking the CEO or something. Uh, and then there were logical, reasonable people who said, hey, maybe don't defend the company that still hasn't actually produced anything yet. Uh, there's nothing to defend. So far, all they've done is miss deadlines and misappropriate their funds. But February comes. People are starting to get excited again. Um, you know, a few consoles had gone out. They were starting to fill orders. It was absolutely a thing that was happening. People were posting pictures. They had gotten their order. So, you know, people were semi-excited again. And the third week of February came. They did not fulfill the orders. And then, this is where Playmaji really lost their damn minds. They went on Twitter. I know it has a new name now. I'm not going to use it because it's dumb. They went on Twitter and they said, Hey, 
So when we said all orders up to November of 2023 would be filled by the third week of February, what we meant was we would start shipping orders on the third week of February. And you all just read it wrong and misunderstood it because you're a bunch of stupids. Um, now, that's not verbatim what they said, but it's pretty damn close. The message was insanely tone deaf, incredibly insulting and offensive to fans, and was just a slap in the face to customers that honestly are being ignored and not acknowledged or apologized to in any way. Uh, so this set everyone into a frenzy. Basically, the attitude shifted, um, aside for a couple simps who were still just, you know, ride or die, mouth on the teat of Playmagic forever. Teat's not the anatomy I really think they had their mouth on, but I would like to pretend YouTube's gonna let me keep my videos up, so we'll go with Teat. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. They had just gaslit their customers, they're just blatantly lying right to our faces, and it's not even a lie that makes sense. Because if that's when you're going to start fulfilling and shipping orders, why would you say all orders up to November of 2023? There's no, there's no hard end if that's when you're going to start shipping. You're not going to start shipping all orders up to this. You're going to start shipping orders. Which ones go out, we won't know. It depends on how long they take and how many you fulfill. Like That's just when you're going to start. You don't give an end date to a process you haven't started yet because you haven't started it yet. That's not, that doesn't make sense. That's not how logistics works. That's not how words work. So it was a blatant, stupid lie, and it was just gaslighting and just bad business practice. Um, I really think whoever crafted that message, not the poor media rep who had to type it out and hit submit, but whoever in legal or whatever C-level executive decided that was the message they need to send out, that person needs to be fired out of a cannon while actually on fire. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, February comes and goes. People still don't have their consoles. A few do. Some orders were fulfilled. You know, to be fair and balanced, TM, C, R, whatever. Uh, and yes, I did steal that. Um... They did fulfill some orders. So the console existed. We all knew it did. Um, but as March came, more and more people started to get them. They started to get, you know, uh, the shipping notification to say, hey, we've created the shipping label. Your console's going to go out. And now let me sidestep my story and distract myself again to tell you a little bit more about me. When I graduated high school, I got a job, uh, a summer job, in between high school and college, where I worked at a electronics reseller. Now, this company may or may not have been run by the mob, and the electronics that we sold may or may not have been legally obtained. I have no evidence that everything was not above board. It just felt really off. But none of that matters. My point is, we sold electronics online. All size and shape, all manner of electronics. Some of them were PCs, some were medical equipment. Uh, we had various monitors. Once we got an old jukebox, um, uh, we got light bars, we got just every kind of electronic device that you could imagine. If it plugged into a wall, it came through our warehouse at one point or another. We had to identify this equipment, we had to list it online for sale, and then when it was sold, someone in our warehouse team, our logistics team, whatever you want to call it, they would go out to the warehouse where the items were, they would pick them up, bring them into the packing room, they would, you know, put in the appropriate foam, place the item, finish off the box, seal the box, weigh it, that would generate the shipping label, they would put that on the box, and then it would be moved to the dock to be picked up on one of our shipping days and go out to the customer. Um, now, our warehouse was a very big room, lots of racks, like the one you see of games here. And what they would do is each rack would have little number cards. This, The number on this card would match the order number that the item was, and it would be right there with the item in that little space on the shelf. Uh, so when an order sold, and we knew that it had to be packed up and fulfilled, that order number went to our logistics team and said, hey, this is the order, here's the number, look for that number in the warehouse, here's a list of items for that order, 
that's what you should be pulling from the shelf where that card is. Uh, put those in a box, send them to so-and-so. Our logistics team was filling anywhere from like 100 to 120 orders a day. It was three people. And then we had shipping, uh, we had like the USPS, UPS, whoever it was, I don't even remember to be perfectly honest. Uh, they would come and pick up orders, I believe it was three days a week. They would have, you know, they would come with their big truck, they would take the pallet with all the pre-packed, pre-labeled orders, put it on their truck, send stuff along. Um, so the longest you would wait to get an order between us creating the label and it going out the door would be... February or would be Friday to Monday. So like if end of the day on Friday you purchased an item and our logistics team happened to see it, uh, the USPS truck had already come. They've already taken orders for the day. So, but they're still going to pack your box and get it ready. So they're going to put the item in the box, generate the label. You'll then get the email notification saying, Hey, your label is generated. They're going to move it over to the warehouse and it's going to stay there until Monday when USPS comes again to pick up the next order. So you're going to wait three days. Play Maji, they decided, hey, we're just going to somehow generate all the labels right now. Um, so my label, for example, was generated in February. Uh, it was February 29th that that was generated. Yep, February 29th. Two weeks later, on March, what was it, 14th, I want to say, 15th, somewhere in there, uh, it was... Second week of March. That's when my console shipped. So in two weeks, um, when you print the label, usually what you have to do is weigh your box with everything already packed in it. The, the package has to be ready to go. You would weigh that. Uh, you use that weight to tell the USPS, all right, I have a package that weighs this much. How much will that cost to ship? USPS will tell you, and that's all an automated system you can do remotely. You don't have to talk to them. Um, they say, all right. A box of these dimensions weighing this much cost X to ship. Um, you generate your label with the plan to spend that much. Put that label on the box. Now this box is ready to ship. That's what happened on February 29th. They had my box. They had a label. It was ready to ship. It took them two weeks. I don't know why I'm putting up my whole hand like this somehow means two weeks. This is the number five. Good job, kids. Um, two weeks to move the box from whatever room they printed the label in over to the the loading bay doors. That's that's how long that took to, to move the box to their own warehouse. It must have been how long it took because that's how long it took to ship. But anyway, people eventually got consoles. It took too long to ship. There was a lot of lying and gaslighting and missed deadlines in between those stages. But people eventually got them. Nearly every order has been filled now. There's a couple stragglers that were having some issues, and there's a whole debacle between Playmaji and WWD. But that's not that's not the issue here. The consoles went out. People have them. So now you may be thinking, well, hey, Mr. Awkward Gamer, sir, internet genius that you are, you mentioned an app that people were getting. What happened with the app? I am riveted in your wonderful storytelling. Well, thank you, kind viewer, for your polite words. Um, and you are very keen-eyed to remember the app that I mentioned. See, what happened with that is nothing at all. Uh, much like with the consoles, how they constantly missed deadlines and then just didn't acknowledge that they missed a deadline or even tried to say, hey, we're doing great because we have a new deadline. Um, the app... You just kind of forgot about it. Uh, they didn't build it. They didn't release it. It doesn't exist. No one has it. Um, so that apology they got and their uh, their gift to everyone for having to deal with their nonsense, um, yeah, that was also a lie. Uh, that also didn't happen. So, yeah. Back to my uh, the original opening statement of my thesis here. Play Maji sucks. Um, but we now have consoles, so yay. Well, yay for some people. See, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> the stories don't end. Um, 
when they started finally getting their consoles in and producing them and releasing them, it turns out their quality control was not the best. Uh, for example, they released their uh, Nintendo 64 module, which would play your Nintendo 64 games. That's pretty cool. Nintendo 64 emulation is notoriously tricky. Uh, it's not great. Most companies fail at it. There are emulators out there that you can get to play N64 ROMs, which, by the way, don't use ROMs. That's illegal. Bad. Um, and they're always crap. You know, those emulators are very hit or miss. Uh, the emulation is not good. A lot of games, the graphics won't render properly. Uh, they'll be very janky. They will stutter a lot. Um, sometimes the controls won't be responsive like they're supposed to, or the audio won't work. Like, just nothing but issues for Nintendo 64 emulation. What Playmaji does is they build their own emulators. They're not using the readily available ones that exist out there today. They are building their own emulators in-house. And their self-proclaimed goal is to have 90% support for games. Uh, so their emulators need to play at least 90% of the, the known official library for whichever console they're emulating before they'll release it. So, they sent out their N64 modules. They hadn't finished the emulator yet. And because they hadn't finished it yet, they hadn't released the software update for the console to allow N64 games to be played. So what happened is, users that had already gotten their Polymega, or users that were just receiving them, when you put the N64 module on, the Polymega did not know what to do. It did not have the appropriate software to support it yet. It had not gotten the update. Uh, so when you put that on, it breaks your console. Uh, the console would not play, it would not start, it would not do anything. For as long as that module was attached to it, it was useless. Now luckily, it did not permanently brick it. If you remove the module, you could then play your console again, just with a different module or without one. Um, but yeah, so they sent out this module that people could not use. That's not great... Um, if you're sending something out to your customer, like they paid for a product, and then you're like, okay, cool, here's your product. If what they receive does not work and cannot work, like it's not an issue with their individual unit, it's an issue with all of them across the board. It's impossible to use them because the support is not there yet. That's bad practice. People would rather not have the product yet and know that you're working on it instead of receiving something that's essentially broken. That was a really bad look. Um, but eventually, the update comes out. People can play it again. Cool. Uh, the problem is they started fulfilling the rest of the orders. Like I said, in March, everyone was getting their consoles. These orders did not get good quality control. A lot of people started receiving broken consoles, where they would get their Polymega, they would put it in. It just didn't work. Like, at all. It just would not function. Um, and they never acknowledged that. If you contacted support, and they read your email and maybe responded to you, which, who knows, could happen the next day, could happen in three weeks. Turn around with their support, not great. Um, they would eventually offer a replacement, but you had to get a hold of them. And also, after waiting however many months or years for your console, you get it, you're excited, you open it, you plug it in, it doesn't work. Like, even if they offer a replacement, that immediate disappointment really sours you to the company. So, a company that already was on loose footing with their fans is now just pissing more of them off entirely. Hey, it's Editing Dean again. Uh, so, one more thing on the topic of quality control here was the uh, latest software update the one that would support the N64 module did eventually come out. Uh, those modules work now. Um, but it introduced a new problem, and that is that the Super Nintendo emulation no longer works correctly. Uh, it works. You can plug in your Super Nintendo cartridge. It will recognize it against the database. You can install it. You can start it and even play it. However, when you do play it, the uh, responsiveness of your controller is always lagging by like a half a second. Uh, so any games that require, you know, precise button presses, 
Um, so something like Mario RPG where you have to time your hits on the enemies or, uh, you know, Super Mario World where you have to time your jumps for platforms, Legend of Zelda where you have to dodge enemy attacks, you know, any of these kinds of games you can't actually play because of this controller lag. So they got one console working and then kind of screwed another in the process. And they've known about the issue since then. So it's been, I don't know, what, a month or whatever now? Um, we assume it's going to be fixed in the next software update. I don't know if they've 100% confirmed that they know how to fix it yet, but uh, they're eventually going to fix it, but they still haven't yet. So everyone finally got their consoles about a month ago and haven't been able to play one of the uh, systems that it supports on that console because they screwed up yet again with their QC and their software. So, yeah, they're just really on a roll. And then other people... <sighs> other people got a console and modules that worked. Everything seemed fine. You put the module in, you put a cartridge in, you play said cartridge, maybe you do it while you're recording your screen and talking to a camera, and you do it to demonstrate how the modules work. And it reads the cart and it recognizes it in the database, and you can play it and install it. Everything is good. And then two weeks later, when you go to install the rest of your collection because you're no longer filming and you're just trying to get everything on there, suddenly the module doesn't work. It did two weeks ago. It doesn't now. Nothing has changed in two weeks. It has not been used or jostled in any way. It was not mishandled. It just no longer works. Even if you put in the same cartridge that it previously read and supported and had no problems with, it will not read that cartridge anymore. Now I say this not as a hypothetical, but as a personal anecdote. This module right here, this NES module that is currently attached, no longer functions. When I first recorded the first part of this video that I can't actually use, I had put in an NES game to install it. It was one of the Zelda games, because the first game I'm going to install in here is going to be Zelda. Let's be perfectly clear. Um, I put it in, and it read it fine. And I demonstrated that. You can see on the screen, if the footage still existed, that it recognized, oh, Legend of Zelda, released this year, blah, blah, blah. So I installed it. I was able to play it. Everything was kosher. Uh, I installed a handful of other games from my childhood, um, just to, you know see multiple things. And I also wanted to demonstrate that when you install games, the picture of that game in the database lights up and acts like a checklist to show, oh, look, your collection fills out this list and you can see what games you still need and what other games are out there. It's kind of cool. So like I said, after that video was done, over the following two weeks, I've been installing the rest of my collection, going through, you know, the PlayStation, the Saturn, the Sega CD, Super Nintendo, Genesis 64, everything. And I was saving the NES for last because I have a lot of Indian homebrew games for the NES. Um, every single game put out by Mega Cat or Pico Interactive or Broke Studio, uh, Watermelon Team, Super Fighter Team, 64 kilobyte games, I have all of them. Anything any of those studios did, I own the physical copies. Uh, there is a ton of games on Kickstarter that I've backed. Uh, all the retro reproductions that Limited Run Games has put out, I have all of those. Uh, I did a video before you saw. I've got Swords and Runes 3 from my buddy Bo. Um, I just, I love the indie game scene, especially for the NES. It's my favorite thing. So I have a ton of indie games for the uh, Nintendo. I wanted to do that last because I was really curious to see which ones would and would not work. Uh, plus, the amount of games I have for the NES is 322 individual cartridges. So that was one of my biggest libraries by far. So save the best for last. That was my approach. So the other day, I'm like, okay, I've got all the other consoles done. I just finished the Saturn. NES is all that's left. Let's go. I plug the module back in. I turn everything on. I'm ready to go. I put the first cart in. It's one of the indie cartridges. Doesn't work. I'm like, ah, that sucks. This one's not supported. Uh, like, it shows up as game media, which is the generic thing you see on the screen when a game that's not in the database shows up. And sometimes that happens. You hit play anyway and just, oh, let me see. 
sometimes the game will work. I had a number of indie uh, games that did work despite not being officially supported. I even had some ROM hacks that people put out. A couple of them worked. That was really cool. Was not expecting that. They don't have to support them. Uh, officially, the company stance is that we don't support them. But these ones, for whatever reason, worked. I was really thrilled about that. So that was great. I was on a roll. But for the NES, they just weren't working. I'm like, ah, rats. You know, I went through maybe a dozen, and all of them, same thing. Showed up as just generic game media, and when I hit the play button, it's just a big green screen. Uh, they're not functioning. So that kind of sucks. So I'm like, all right, let me, you know, shift tactics for a bit. Let me just install uh, some of the official releases. The first one I grabbed was Wally Bear and the No Gang which is not actually an official cartridge. It's an unofficial cartridge. Uh, I put that in, same thing. Game media, green screen. I'm like, oh, well, they did say unofficial cartridges won't always work. You know, some of the 10 gen cards, or the quattro cards, the various other unofficial things that were part of the classic library, but never received the Nintendo seal of approval. <sighs> Whether or not they're gonna work is kind of up in the air. You know, officially their stance is, we focus on supporting official games. So I'm like, okay, you know, Wally Bear not working, I mean, that really sucks. It was a game I played a lot as a kid. Um, I was really, you know, I wanted it to work, but fine if it doesn't. I guess they never said it would. I can't be mad at them for that. So I put in Star Tropics, which is one of the games I had actually initially installed uh, when I was demoing this on that first day in recording. So I'm like, Star Tropics, I know is work. Uh, I know it works, rather. In fact, that specific cart I had already cleaned to get it to work the first time, so this specific cartridge I know the console supports. It has already come up, it's already recognized on the DV, I've already installed it. I know it works. I put that one in, once again, generic game media, and I hit play, and I get a green screen. So suddenly, my games weren't failing, the module is. It's not recognizing or reading any of my games, even the ones that it previously read. And so I took to the Discord. I mention it there uh, because people on there are very active uh, and they're very, for the most part, supportive. Uh, so I'm like, hey guys, I'm having this issue. Thoughts. Uh, and I got a whole slew of responses. Some people are saying, hey, maybe try taking the module out, put a different module in, read a game with that module, uh, basically wake the console up, get it to understand how to read games again, then pop that one off, put the NES one back in, try again. I did that. No bueno. Still getting a green screen generic game medium. Uh, then some people said, hey, do you have your Wi-Fi disabled? And I said, yes, I do. Because, and this is something I didn't mention earlier, uh, Wi-Fi causes errors on your, on your Polymega. If you have your Wi-Fi enabled, sometimes the console just crashes. For no reason, it'll just crash. They'll do a weird, staticky, beepy kind of sound, and then everything will seize up, and then eventually it'll just die. Um, that's the Wi-Fi. Somehow, if you disable Wi-Fi, that error goes away. Don't know what the hell that's all about. That's another instance of QC not doing their jobs, but here we are. So I'm like, I do have it disabled. They're like, maybe try re-enabling it. There's no more updates out there or anything that you miss. It's just, you know, Wi-Fi being on versus Wi-Fi being off. The OS has different settings now, so maybe give it a shot. So I did that. Turned the Wi-Fi back on. Tried it again. No go. I tried removing the module, put it on another module, read, that worked, switched back to the NES, the whole process over again, but with Wi-Fi on, still nothing. Someone else said, hey, make sure you clean the hell out of your carts, which I did. Uh, you can't see because it's off screen, but I have a big box of Q-tips and the isopropyl alcohol cleaning solution, whatever. Um, I was meticulous in cleaning all the pins and all of the carts. They are clean. Uh, it didn't work. And Star Tropics, like I mentioned, that specific cart had already been read, recognized, and installed using this module before. So it doesn't need to be cleaned again. I already know it works in here. I did clean it again just in case. Uh, I tried it. Still nothing. Some people said maybe uh, there's like death grip. You know, maybe the pins just not registering or registering too tight, whatever it is, put in one side at an angle and kind of, you know, push it down in that way just to make sure it's perfectly aligned, everything's good. I did all the things. None of the things worked. 
I looked inside at the 72 pin connector to make sure there's no corrosion, none of the pins are bent, there's no debris stuck in there, there's no issues, and there aren't. It still, it just does not work. So I contacted support. I haven't heard back. So that's why I'm making this video now. See, my goal was I really did want to wait until I had gone through and done all of the roughly 1,300 games, and I wanted to report back to you with which ones did and did not work. I wanted to be able to give you a full, comprehensive list of, out of all the titles I have, uh, official titles, unofficial titles, indie and homebrew titles, ROM hacks that reported to cartridge, reproductions, everything, I wanted to give you a full rundown of what does and does not work but I can't, because I don't know when I'm getting a replacement for my NES module. To be honest, I don't even know if they're going to replace it. I still haven't heard back from customer service. If they don't replace it, I am going to be furious because it's very expensive. I used it one time, and it died within a two-week span. That is absolutely unacceptable. But I don't know. Got to wait and see what the future holds. Got to wait and hear from customer service, and that could take who knows how long. So, making this video. Now, I've said all that. Uh, half this video now, I believe, has been me telling you how awful Playmaji is and how awful the rollout of this console is. Let me take a turn here. This is a solid console. The company that makes it is shit, and sometimes what you get is a broken hunk of garbage. But the majority of people are not having those issues. The majority of people got a solid console that works as intended, all the modules play the way they're supposed to, and everything is good. And for those people, they sing the praises of this console. Even with the price tag, even with the weight, people are thrilled with what they got. And honestly, NES module aside, I am one of those people. I am thrilled at this console. It installed most of my games. It, they all run wonderfully. The controllers are incredibly comfortable. The interface could be improved, but it's also not terrible. Um, it's just, it is a lovely console. It is a great way to play your games. You have everything all in one place. Uh, like I said, it's a little iffy, the interface. It's a little confusing trying to get stuff. To actually just see a full list of all your games is not the first thing on the homepage, and it really should be. Uh, also, if you go into your collection for each individual console, the um, games that you installed custom that didn't match the database don't show with your uh, console-based collection. So, for example, if I go into Super Nintendo, I'll see my Super Nintendo games. What I won't see is Hyper Metroid, which is a ROM hack for the Super Nintendo that does work on this console, surprisingly, um, but it obviously doesn't match the database. There's no ROM hacks in there. Uh, so that shows up in what's called Extended Sets, which basically is the bucket for all your custom games, regardless of console. Uh, that's disappointing. If I go into the Super Nintendo menu, I don't care if it's officially part of the Super Nintendo database or not, all I know is it's part of my collection. It's a Super Nintendo game that I installed. I want to see it there. Uh, so that's a little annoying, a little obnoxious. I do not like that. But it's still accessible. You just have to do a roundabout thing. Um, it still plays, and everything is really good. It's very solid. But there is room for improvement. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Like I said, the console is great. Uh, it reads and plays most games. Uh, there are some weird exceptions that I want to address, and one of them is up here. Two of them are up here. Okay. These are a couple games um, that I'm going to talk about for a second. The first one being Egg for the PlayStation. It's a Japanese title. I don't know how well you can see, but uh, it's Japanese. Everything in the back. Entirely in Japanese. You probably can't read any of that. My point is, this is an official release. It's an actual game for the PlayStation. This was an official Sony-approved release. This does not recognize. When I put this in, I get Game Media, the generic message. 
Now, when that happens, you have two options. You can either manually match it to a game in the database, or you can enter it as a custom game, like I said before. Now, manually, if I scroll through the database, egg is in the database. Multiple versions of it, uh, because there are multiple iterations of this, different disk images. Um, and I can match to it. But this disk, for whatever reason, when it gets the hash of the image of this disk, it does not match any of those ones. So there's either additional versions of the game that were not registered in their database, or it's just not reading my disk properly. Either way, I had to manually match it, and when you manually match it, it still shows up as a custom game. It doesn't show as actually being in your collection, and it does not light up that icon in the database of PlayStation games. That's a little annoying, but it's fine. I can play the game. I don't care. Uh, this one, however, Darkstone, a very good game, another official release. I will show you real quick. Uh, it's a black disc, so I don't know how well you can see, but this disc is damn near flawless. You know, there's no deep scratches or scuffs. There's, there's no signs of disc rot. There's no spots. There's no chips or nicks or cracks in the disc. This is a very good disc. When I put this in, it did recognize it. It matched it to the database. It said, oh, this is a copy of Darkstone. I know what this is. So I told it to install, and it started doing that. Uh, now, CD games, when you install them, they take a minute. Cartridges, they install instantly. Like I said, the file size is tiny. They're just, boop, done. When you hit install on a disc, you get a countdown bar. It's going to take a minute. In fact, it's going to take anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes. Uh, but Darkstone started installing. And it went for a while. It got to about 96%. Then it failed and ejected itself and said, Ah, sorry, invalid installation. We encountered an error. Please go to hell. Um, and it would not install. So I tried again. Actually, first, I tried cleaning the disc. I got a microfiber cloth. I gently wiped it just to make sure there's no debris. You know, a stray dog hair didn't get on there. There's no dust caked on it. There's no fingerprints uh, or any kind of smudges or oils or anything on the surface of this disc. I made sure 100% clean. I reinserted, tried again, same end result. So it's an official disc. It even recognized the image. Um, there's nothing on the disc to mar it from working. I've played this on the PlayStation and played the game to completion and beaten it multiple times. So I know for a fact the disc is playable all the way through. It just won't install it. And I had that happen for a number of games, actually. Um, Lunar Silver Star Saga for the Sega Saturn. Same issue. Um, the disc is perfect. It's flawless. It's basically brand new. Would not play. Um, Azel uh, Panzer Dragoon RPG. Another Saturn game. Also an import, actually. Um... Likewise, did not work. All the discs are perfect. Just wouldn't play them. Um, a copy of D, the Sega Saturn. Didn't work. Disc looks great. Just wouldn't do it. Uh, so that's annoying. I had a number of discs like that, and I just... I don't understand what the issue is. Like I said, the discs all look flawless. If they were scratched, I would get it. I had a couple games that... Do... do, do. Wow. Yeah, Sledstorm for the PlayStation. Don't even know why I have this game. Uh, this one, you're not going to be able to see too well, uh, but this was one that someone tried to resurface or put in a cleaner. Uh, they didn't do it properly. The whole thing is just a giant scuff. Basically, it looks like you took this disc, put it surface down on a piece of really fine grit sandpaper, and just did one of these. Um, this didn't read. I, I didn't expect it to. I put it in, and it's just like, ha ha ha, no. And I totally accepted that. The disc is in garbage condition. I don't expect it to play. I'm not upset about that. That is not an error on the console's part. That's 100% how it should have handled that disc. Honestly, it shouldn't have even spat it out. It should have chewed it up and just shit it out the back and said, no. That wasn't even a disc. You don't get it back. That's garbage. Bad on you for putting that in here in the first place. So, I'm fine. It's the discs that are in great condition 
that it just fails with that kind of annoyed me. But, again, I put over 1,300 games through this console. No, I had over 1,300 games to put through this console. 300 or so of those NES ones haven't gone through it yet. But I've done about 1,000 games, and I think there were 8 or 9 where it read the game but would not install it, it aired out. I'm okay. It It's crappy that it happens. I don't want the failure rate to be greater than zero, but whatever. It is what it is. Um, basically, I just... I don't even know where I'm going with that conversation. I guess it's just explaining things that can happen, uh, because it does. You know, it will happen. It happened to some other people, too. Talking in the Discord, a lot of people would have a game here or there that just for whatever reason wasn't working. Uh, I had a couple Famicom games that I cleaned the hell out of those pins. My Famicom adapter, I cleaned both sides of that, the receiver and the pins at the bottom. I cleaned everything. And just those two carts, it just, they didn't work. I don't know why everything was fine. They just did not work. Um, it just happens, you know? Sometimes it is what it is. Uh, but overall... It reads and plays most games. It's it's really good. I do I did want to include a finite list of <coughs> all the noteworthy well, I wanted to include a finite list of every indie game reproduction, ROM hack, whatever that I tried and whether or not it worked. Uh, but I can't because I can't get through the NES thing. So I will give you some of the highlights. Um Pure Solar and Paprium, uh, very popular titles from Watermelon Games, unfortunately, do not work. Um, the Genesis module did not read them, would not recognize them. I just got generic game media message, and when I tried to play them, no go. Uh, I was very disappointing there. Pure Solar especially is just a massive title for the Genesis. Literally, it's the biggest ROM file on any Genesis cartridge ever. Um, I was really excited for that one. That one you can't play. But Sacred, Genesis, Sacred Line Genesis and Sacred Line 2, also released by Watermelon Games recently, they do both work. Uh, you have to run them as custom games, obviously. It doesn't understand what they are natively. But they do work. And that's really cool. Uh, like I mentioned before, Hyper Metroid, which is a ROM hack of Super Metroid, that also worked. Uh, Pocket Monsters 2 for the Genesis, which is, uh, for anyone unfamiliar, a very interesting and really cool ROM hack um, that turns Pokemon into like a side-scrolling mascot platformer, like an Earthworm Jim kind of thing, basically. Um, sadly, that does not work. I was super disappointed. I was looking more forward to that than pretty much anything. It does not work. Uh, so, sadness there. But... A lot of the Mega Cat carts and the Pico Interactive carts did work. Um, if you want to play, you know, Fork Parker's Crunch Out, you absolutely can. Uh, if you want to play the Turrican reproduction carts, uh, Super Turrican Collection and Super Turrican 2, those both worked. Uh, it actually, it, it saw them as valid carts. I was able to install them. I had to put them as custom cartridges, but I was able to do so. Those worked. Uh, surprisingly, my t prototype test carts for North and South and Silkworm both worked. Uh, North and South, it did the mesh did not match. Um, it didn't recognize it as a game in its database because, of course, it won't. It's a prototype. It's an early build of the code. Um, so I had to put it in as a custom, but it did work after I did that. I was able to play it. Uh, Silkworm... I guess I have a later build on that cart because it actually matched it to the official release of Silkworm. Um, but again, fully playable. So, yeah, there's a lot of games do work on here. Oh, another one I should mention, actually. The limited run uh, reproductions for the Sega CD. They did like a Night Trap and Ground Texas Zero and a few other ones. Those all work. In fact, most of those even match to the game. Uh, so you don't have to do anything. You just put it in. It says, oh, this is this game. I know what this is. And they play. Uh, I thought that was actually really cool. Um, I did have to match Night Trap, but only because Night Trap had multiple releases on the Sega CD. One was the Sega CD. One was the 
uh, Sega CD 32 or the 32X CD. So when I put it in, it didn't know which it was. I had to look it up and match it manually. Uh, but they do play. So, you know, even if you collect a lot of indie stuff, and I know that's a very minor niche crowd. Like, I clearly am one of those people. If you're watching this video, A, why have you wasted so much time watching one of my videos? But B, you're probably one of those folks too, because I definitely cater to a certain crowd on this channel. Um, you will be surprised at the amount it does support. It's not going to support everything. There's going to be some disappointments for sure. But it will support a good amount. And that's pretty cool. Um, that first day when I was going through the NES, one of the first things I did is tried a uh, like a pile I had of just loose cards that are all indie games. Uh, like Dragon Feet, Dragon Leap, the 8-bit Christmas games, all of those. Uh, most of them did not work. But a couple did. Battle Kid, for example. Battle Kid, Fortress of Evil. Or Fortress of Peril, whatever the name is. That one worked. Um... And there's just, you get a lot of surprises along the way when you're doing indie stuff. And then your official carts and discs, almost always are they going to go. Like I said, I had a couple that didn't read that I'm kind of annoyed about. I don't know why they didn't read. Uh, I actually just got a second copy of Darkstone that I'm going to try and install and see if maybe it was related to that disc uh, and not a game-specific issue. But either way, you know, 90% of what I've put in so far has been a success. Well over 90% with official titles. And that was always their goal from the beginning, is to have 90% support or more for their emulators. And they hit that mark. They absolutely did. So, at the end of the day, this will deliver what it says it will. If you just went away... Sorry, I'm slowly choking to death right now. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> if you just went away to play all your old games without having to switch carts or discs or consoles, this is the way to go. It's convenient. It's all in one package. The controls are comfortable. The UI is usable. The features are lackluster now, but there's room for improvement. It's not a bad console. It's not. It's a bad company. The process to get the console is crap. Uh, their QC leaves a lot to be desired, so for some people, it's a broken console, but by and large, for the majority of folks, it is a good console. It does what it says it's going to do. It is very fun. Uh, it plays things well. The emulation, even on the 64, is really well done. In fact, that was one of the first things I wanted to test on it. Uh, Tyler, who you know, is my Mario Kart person, and as the Internet's go-to Mario Kart YouTube channel... We, of course, the first thing we tested on this thing was Mario Kart 64. Uh, like I said, I got a second 64 controller from them. I plugged those bad boys in, and we played it. And you know what? It emulated perfectly. There were no audio or visual glitches. Uh, there was no staggering or frame skipping. Everything played well. It felt like we were on the Nintendo 64, just with a better controller. <clears throat> so... It's a good console. It really is. It'll do what you want it to do. It's going to do what you expect of it. And if you don't collect every single indie title you can find, if you just have a bunch of games from your childhood, those are all going to play. So I don't recommend the company. I don't encourage people to buy from Playmaji because they suck and they have not done anything to redeem themselves. But... If you're already decided, I want to give money to this company, and you're just trying to make sure the console is going to work when you do, it will, you should, it's a good console. And now finally, I want to talk about the room for improvement for this console, because if I just come here and complain for, Jesus Christ, an hour and 20 minutes about this company and this console, then I'm just a whiny asshole. I want to talk about what they can and should do to improve things. Uh, first and foremost, things that we already know are coming. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, briefly, the light gun controller. That's going to be a big one. See, they took orders for a light gun controller, and what it's going to do is act as the light gun that's sold with any or all the consoles that this supports. Uh, so that includes your NES Zapper, uh, the Menacer from Sega Genesis, the Super Scope, 
uh, the light guns that were available on the PlayStation and Saturn, this should cover all of those. So whether you want to play House of the Dead or Duck Hunt or Yoshi Safari, you're covered. You'll plug it into this, and then I don't know how they intend to the screen thing. It'll probably have some sort of receiver bar like the Wii did. Um, but you will have a light gun that works on modern TVs. Uh, for any of you that have a copy of Duck Hunt, have experienced already, when you try to use that on an HDTV, not an old school analog television, the frames refresh too fast and the light gun doesn't work. Uh, when you pull that trigger on a classic TV, the whole screen flashes white for a split second and wherever your target is, flashes a different color. When that happens, the light gun looks at what's directly in front of it and says, oh, I see white or I see black. If I see white, that means I missed. I hit somewhere else on the rest of the screen. But if I see black, that was the target. I hit it. Good job, me. Well, HDTVs refresh too fast and the gun never gets the chance to see that screen of the white and the black, so it never knows what to do. This modern light gun fixes that. It does not depend on the refresh rate to know if you hit. You get to play your light gun games again. That is huge. No one else has pulled that off. You can't do that with a Retron. Uh, you can't do that in RetroArch. You can't do that on even the AVS and the analog consoles. No one else has that. So when Playmaji and the Polymega release their light gun controller, that will be a unique draw specific to them. No one else will be doing that. That will give them an edge. That's very important. They need that edge. They need a reason to set themselves as self. When you're asking customers to spend $1,000 on your console, you got to give them a reason why. That will be a big one. Uh, likewise, as I mentioned before, we already know an Atari module is coming. Um, Atari partnered with them. They already announced the module. Pre-orders are not available yet, which is fine because they have not handled pre-orders well. Um, but we know what's coming. And what's really cool there is that Atari now also owns Atari Age, a website that indie homebrew developers would self-publish their games through Atari Age. And you could buy physical cartridges. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I reviewed Halo 2600, uh, which was a demake of Halo for the Atari. That was released through Atari Age. Um, so, there's big potential there. When they release the Atari module, whatever they're going to call it, they 100% should have Atari working to scour through Atari Age, which, again, they own, find all the games that they published, and get the images of those games in that database. It should recognize all of those games as though they were official carts right off the bat. If they have that built in, to where that functionality already exists, not only does it significantly increase the database of Atari games, but for indie collectors like me, which are the main demographic here, it gives them a way to play these games that they can't otherwise. Because again, other people aren't doing this. Um, I, I know that I keep mentioning uh, like RetroArch, which is just all the emulators, but it's partnered with Retro Achievements, and that's People don't generally consider a game supported by RetroArch unless it's also supported by Retro Achievements. That's the appeal of using RetroArch is getting those achievements for your old games. Retro Achievements does not have them for a lot of games that aren't official releases. If it can't recognize the ROM, it doesn't know what achievements to assign to it. The same as how the database works here. It's all based based on that the mesh. Um, so if their Atari module has support for all those extra games people can finally play those officially, quote-unquote. Um, that would be a big deal for collectors. They would really be dropping balls. They didn't do that. I definitely hope they do. Um, and now things that they haven't announced or said they were going to do, but they would really be just leaving money on the table if they don't. The big one is, as I've mentioned multiple times now, achievements. Um... Analog has not done achievements in theirs. Uh, um, who is it does the AVS? Retrobit uh, did not have achievements in theirs. RetroArch does, 
but only for official titles. So Polymega needs to also have achievements. They need to have a team internally that creates these achievements and releases them, and that's what's going to set them apart. Not the achievements, because RetroArch has them too. Having an internal team is what would set them apart. Because on RetroArch right now, it's all fan-driven. Any volunteer who knows how to use hex editors and basically learn how to flag a specific change in your save data that recognizes, hey, I did this one thing, pop the achievement, uh, anyone can generate achievements and store them out there and add them to the set for the game. The problem is, different people have wildly different ideas of what an achievement set should look like. Uh, the Adventures of Lolo, for example. Great game, love a game. Uh, it's a puzzle game from my childhood that I've played many, many times and will play many again. The achievement set for that is pretty straightforward. Every, every time you complete a world, you get an achievement. If you completed it without taking damage, you get a second achievement for that. Um, when you complete the whole game, you've gotten all the achievements. I think there's like one or two extra ones for completing a level and having you know three extra egg shots or whatever the case is. But they're all very straightforward. It's just part of beating the game. That's normal. However, other games are a little different. See, some of the people creating these achievements are nice way of saying idiots um idiots they think a game is only fun if you're torturing yourself and just being an absolute try hard ass clown um so for example pokemon red and blue if you want to get the achievements for those you have to run a nuzlocke uh you have to you know challenge each gym trainer with none of your Pokemon leveled higher than the ones that gym trainer has by the time you finish the gym, which means at the start of it, you have to be a level or two under so you have room to level up as you battle. Uh, there's also, you know, ones where you have to catch certain Pokemon at certain points and just do things in a very specific way that makes the game not just challenging, but basically unfun. Uh, likewise, in The Legend of Zelda, you know, there's an infamous thing that people in the Zelda fan base community, whatever, know in the original game, you can technically get to Ganon without ever picking up the sword. Uh, you can skip the sword altogether, and you can kill enemies with sub-weapons. It's, it's a pain in the ass to do. No one in their right mind would ever do it. It's not fun. I only did it once, and it was frustrating as hell. I just wanted to do it to say that I could. Um... Most people are never going to do that. People don't play games to be annoyed. You know, you're not going out of your way to make the game experience as unfun as possible. And yet, doing the No Sword quest in Legend of Zelda is one of the achievements. That's unreasonable. Achievements should not reflect playing the game in a manner of way that no one would realistically want to do. And so Play Maji, and one of their lead developers has already said as much, if and when they do achievements, they're going to do them in-house because everything should be standardized and balanced and you should know what to expect from game to game. You know, they should all have basically the same level of challenge and expectation regardless of what game you're playing. And if they have an internal team and they can QC their own achievement sets, that's something accomplishable, whereas outsourcing them to another company or just letting fans create them like they do in retro achievements you never know what you're going to get. Also, the Retro Achievement servers go down all the time. They're not dependable, and Playmaji wouldn't have to deal with that either. So, they should definitely have achievements. They should build them themselves. That would set them apart quite a bit. I really hope they go that route. It sounds like they're gonna. Their lead developer has already talked about what they would do with achievements, which means they've already thought about it to some degree internally. So, while it hasn't been officially announced... I'm choosing to believe that it's coming. It sounds like it might be, and I really hope it is. Another big thing that they've kind of mentioned but not given any specific details about is, like I mentioned earlier, a cheat menu, uh, where when you hit your Polymega button and you go into the menu screen, there should be a cheat option. All the standard Game Genie or Game Shark codes that were available you know, in the books pre-installed on the Game Shark or pre-acknowledged for the Game Genie those should be programmed in. 
because this already has a database it's matching to and it knows what game you're playing, it should know what cheats are available for that game and have them available to you. You shouldn't have to look them up. You shouldn't have to enter the codes. They should all be there and toggleable, and you just put in the ones you want and go at it. Um, and some other consoles already have this. So this wouldn't set them apart. This would just be playing catch-up. Uh, the analog, for example, <coughs> has that built-in already. Uh, all their systems already have the cheat menus built-in, so you can insert your Game Genie codes. For some games, some of the codes are already there. Uh, for others, you can save the codes after you enter them with the name of what they do and then just toggle them on and off for future use. Playmagia should do the same. Um, like I said, it won't set them apart, but it'll at least catch them up to some of these other consoles, and then it it just makes the other consoles harder to justify. Like, yes, the analog consoles are FPGA. That's really cool. They'll support the indie stuff that this won't. But all the other advantages that they have, this also has plus extra if they implement achievements and release the light gun. So they just they need to play catch up so that then they can shine the light on their other things to still pull themselves ahead. Uh, and lastly, um, well, not lastly, I've got a couple more. Uh, but one that I really think would be a massive selling point, it would not only set them apart, but it would just absolutely blow away the customers and fans and really drive sales here. This would take some work on Playmaji's side. They would have to hire some additional employees to do it. But if they had an internal team to develop translation patches for games, that would just they would be leagues above everyone else in the games. Like this that would be a game changer. If they had a team that, you know, they would have to be bilingual, they could understand Japanese and English and they create these translation patches that then can just be toggled. Because again, in your database, you know what game is being played, you already know what it is, um, you know exactly where in the code all the language is going to be, and can just replace it. They could develop a patch that would instantly just translate that, that someone could just toggle on, and suddenly Japanese characters are now English characters, and all the words are readable without knowing Japanese. <clears throat> That's huge. A lot of collectors have gotten into collecting import games. Most collectors can't play them. Egg, for example. I can't play this game. I can't read Japanese. I can't read any of the menus. I have no idea what anything on the back of this box says. I know what the gameplay is, but I don't know how to navigate through the menus to get to the gameplay. If they could put that translation in there so that when it pops up, all the menus are suddenly in English, I could play this game, because the Polymega ignores the region coding. Like, you can install any game from any region. It's fine. Uh, so I'm already halfway there as far as being able to play my Japanese games. I just need the Japanese to now be understandable in English. And that's what Playmaster should be doing. You've let people install the games, now give them a way to play them. That would set them apart like no one else has. No one else is doing anything like that. And this is a good time to do it. Uh, again, I work in IT, and AI is getting really good. They could put in an AI system that reads the text on the screen and translates it to English in real time. Or they could translate it all using AI ahead of time, generate the patch that way. They'd probably only need one or two employees just to manage the AI and save the actual patch file. Um, basically, what I'm saying is there are ways to do this. And it probably wouldn't even be too hard if they did use AI tools to assist them. But it would set them apart and just, they would be doing something that no one else is doing and gamers would kill for. So, if they're not looking into that already, they really need to be. That would be a huge advantage for this console that absolutely no one else is doing. If this had translations and all the games that you put in can just be played by you in English, even though they're originally only released in Japanese, that's massive. That's, you know, tens or hundreds of extra games for each console that it supports that we can now play that we never had access to before. You know, the entire Legend of the River King franchise didn't come out in English. Uh, Choaniki did not come out in English. A number of Final Fantasy games 
never came out in English. All of those games are now playable if they have that translation ability in the Polymega. People would clamor for that. These would be flying off shelves because now I can play all these games that I always missed. And this is the only way I can play them. That would be amazing. That they need to do. And then the last thing I will mention, and then I'll eventually shut up because this is a very long video and I apologize, but I really did want to get in depth on everything in this console because it's an investment, but it's a big deal. Um, the last thing I want to bring up is there's definitely room for growth with the disk drive. Like I said, uh, it has decent support. It does the Sega Saturn, the Sega CD, Sony PlayStation, and the TurboGrafx CD as well as like the 32X CD, but that's just an extension of the Sega CD. Um, that's pretty good. You can install a lot of games. There's a lot of great stuff across those. The PlayStation especially is full of RPGs. It's a great console. Like, It does some good stuff. However, there's other consoles that it should really support that it currently doesn't. Uh, the Jaguar CD is not supported. Absolutely should be. There's no reason this couldn't handle that. Uh, likewise... The 3DO, you know, I don't know of many 3DO emulators out there, but I know the 3DO was a decent console that people liked. There are games out there for it that people would love to play. Um, this should support those. And then the big ones, getting into libraries with a lot of exclusives, the CDI and the Dreamcast. They are not currently supported. They absolutely should and could be. Um, now, for people that are techie, the CDI is a little eh. Um, you know, Interactive CDs had a slightly different file set, but this could handle it. And there are some games on that console to make it worth playing. Not only was there Mario Hotel and the Three Zeldas, which are infamous for being awful, but they're not as bad as people give them credit for. Uh, there was a number of other stuff on there. Seventh Guest was on the CDI. That's a great game. Uh, little Devil was actually pretty fun. There's an Alice in Wonderland game, which I'm biased, but I love Alice in Wonderland, so I would be happy to have that back. And Tetris for the CDI had some really top-tier music. Um, so there's good stuff in that library that people would like to have. This would give them a way to do that. Also, Nobilia, which I uh, reviewed not long ago. But then, I mean, I think like two years ago now. Uh, that was an indie title for the CDI. It'd be cool to have another way to play it. Uh, but the Dreamcast, that's the big one. If they get the Dreamcast on here, that is a big win for them. And now some of you may know... The Dreamcast plays on what's called a GD-ROM, not a CD-ROM. It's a disc, the hardware is slightly different, but the thing is, the hardware that Sega built to read those discs was just a CD-ROM. They just tweaked it. They took all the parts, all the mechanisms from a CD-ROM, and they slowed it down so the CD spins at half speed so the laser can read information that's packed more tightly together on the disc. Um, I'm not going to get overly techy, but basically they found a way to write more on the disc by writing all the lines closer together. Well, drives have come a long way since then. Optical drives, uh, the, the capacity and the capabilities are better now. There's no reason they couldn't use software to control the drive and just make it spin slower and read those discs. Like It's absolutely something they could do with the hardware that's on board. They shouldn't need a special drive for that. What they have should be enough. And their lead developer, I keep mentioning him, he's active on the Discord, so a lot of us have talked to him. Um, he has said, it, it's, it was captured on the Discord, him saying it, that he did get a Polymega in-house, so one of his development ones, not a production one. Um, he did get it to play Dreamcast games. So not only is it possible, it's something they've done. Um, they would have to, you know, build out the rest of the emulator and build their own BIOS file, because I didn't mention it before, but they create their own BIOS files. Uh, they, for legal reasons, they can't use the original ones. They have to create their own. And they have, so they would have to do that. They'd have to, you know, build an all-new emulator, new BIOS, whatever. But they can do it. And the disk drives are already there. They're already included. All these consoles have them. So... If they want to apologize to fans and make up for their mistakes and win back their fans, one of the easiest ways to do it for them would be to send out a free update. I mean, all the updates should be free. Like, you should not pay to update your console. But they should send out an update to their fans and say, hey, 
with this update, with the version that we're rolling out, we've increased console support. You know, the same console you already have, the disk drive that's already on board, installed, and usable, will now read disks from X additional consoles. If they do that, suddenly, everyone that has a Polymega has now increased the database of games that they can play. You know, like I said, I have 1,300 games that I can put in this. Well, if they all of a sudden expand it to work with the CDI, the Dreamcast, the 3DO, the Jaguar CD, well, now that goes up to 1,500 or 1,600, however many I have. There's a lot. Um, that's a big deal. Nowhere else can you just add 300 games to your playable library like that while spending no money and exuding no effort. That would be a huge win, and that would definitely go away a ways to making it up to your fans. Because your fans paid for the ability to play the consoles that it already plays. And a lot of them feel like they didn't get the money. Well, that's not true. I'm being unfair. A lot of them are very content. Some of them are upset and feel like they didn't get their money's worth because they waited so long and their console didn't work when it arrived or broke shortly after or whatever the issue is. So, if they can all of a sudden roll out this extra functionality and just improve their console without us having to do anything, that goes a long way to showing, hey, we know we've screwed up, we want to give you something extra that you weren't expecting, that you weren't entitled to, that we never said was coming, but we've decided to do it because you deserve it. If they do that, that's going to win back a lot of fans and give them a lot of good favor and just people are going to think of them positively. You know, look at Hello Games. They promised the world with No Man's Sky. Uh, and then the game came out, and it did not live up to their promises. It did not do the things they said it was going to do. They just were not in the game. Uh, they lied. <clears throat> a lot of people were upset, rightfully so. If, if someone tells you you're going to get X, so you buy it, and you get half of X, it's not what you paid for. You were lied to. It's a bait and switch. It's actually illegal. Um, and, you know, people were upset with them for the longest time. So the developer said, okay, watch. And over the last seven years, they have quadrupled the size of that game. They have put in every kind of content you can imagine, and then some. They have built it up in ways that nobody thought would happen. Recently, they added the ability to customize and create your own ships. It is amazing what they've done with that game. It is now one of the Internet's favorite games, and everybody says that Hello Games is one of the best companies in the industry right now. That's where they're at right now, and they started on a lie. You can save your reputation. You can come back from the worst things if you put in the effort, if you genuinely try to make your fans happy, apologize for your mistakes, and move forward. Playmaji can do that, too. There's no reason they have to fail. You know, the Polymega doesn't have to die after this initial order fulfillment. Like, no one's saying it's going to, but I'm just saying it doesn't have to. It is a solid console. There's a lot of promise. It already does a lot, and it can do a lot more. So I just really hope that Playmaji can take the initiative, understand what they did wrong and what they have to do to fix it, and really take some initiative and just build this out to be the best console it could be. Uh, I want to see it succeed. You know... As fun as it is to complain about things, everyone wants to be the angry video game nerd and just shit on what's bad. Sometimes literally in his case. Um, but I I love the game industry. I love video games. I, I don't I don't do this to be negative. You know, video games have always been a positive thing in my life. So I want the industry to move forward. I want people to succeed in this space. I would love to see Playmaji make a huge comeback and have this be the next big thing in gaming. You know, in the last few years, especially since the pandemic, there's been a retro renaissance in gaming. Retro is cooler now than it was when those systems were active. You know, video games are mainstream now. Everyone plays video games. And in the last few years, everyone plays retro games. You know, demakes and reproductions and collections of old games are just they're super frequent and common and being released all the time. New people 
all over are developing for these old consoles. Like I said, for the NES, I have over a hundred indie titles for the NES. A third of my NES library is stuff that's released in the last decade, well after the consoles died. So I would love to see this thrive in that space, in partnership with those people. You know, this was designed for people that collect and love retro games. And with the retro space being as big and popular as it is right now, and so many people being passionate about these old games, I want this to do well. I want this to embrace those people. I want this to fill that need and give people a way to play these games that they're all realizing again that they love. So, as much as I've said negative things in this video, that's not because I want to steer you away from this console. It's because I... It would be unfair to pretend that everything is great now. It's not. But it can be. So if you take anything away from this, especially if you're someone at Playmaji and you're watching this for some reason, what you should take away is that the console is already good, but it absolutely can be great. This can be the go-to. Uh, people, this could dethrone analog. Like, this could become the next big thing in retro gaming. I know the owners of several game stores, and I would go in there and, you know, sing the praises of this console and pitch to them, hey, why don't you stock these? People could play half your store with one of these if you had them in stock. Sell these. Push these at your store. Like, and if these were in a store, I could see them selling. Like, I just, I want these to thrive. They just, they're right there. They're just not quite over that hump. And that's what I want to see happen. I want these to take off. Two years from now, I want this video to have 100,000 views. Not because I want my channel to blow up, although that would be nice, but because everyone should be talking about this console. This should be the next big thing that everyone wants to learn about and talk about and get their hands on. Um, and I just, I don't know, I kind of hope I get to see that happen. I really think it has the promise and it could be that thing. So that's how I'm going to end this video. Right now, this is really good. If you have a big retro collection, especially if it's mostly official titles, this will let you play a lot of them, and you'll have a good time. The controllers are great, the UI is passable, the emulation is actually surprisingly well done, considering it's all custom-built in-house. It's good. It will serve its need, it is fun, you will enjoy it. Take that how you will. Uh, but going forward, I really hope to hear more about this. I hope everyone starts talking about it. I hope they do some of the things I listed to take it from good to great. I want this to be the next big thing. I really hope it gets there. I think it could. And if and when it does, I won't even say I'll told you so. I'll just help celebrate it with everyone else because that will be really, really cool. Um, but now I've talked a lot. My voice and throat are hoarse. Um, I feel like I'm choking. So I'm going to go. And now that this video is finally done, in the last two, three weeks that I've spent on it and planning it are over, uh, I'm going to go play some video games. So I'll see you guys later.